Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of House of Talisha with me, Isabel Talisha Swatch. On this occasion, I bring you a literary suggestion as I also do here on occasion. And today I bring to you a special kind of literature because this is journalism that we are going to talk about. And literary journalism to be more precise. And what is literary journalism, you may ask? It is journalism, plain and simple, but written with literary techniques such as scene depiction, character composition, a voice of the author. And it is very timely and timeless as Phyllis Frews once characterized it. The author I bring to you is Jack London, whom you probably know as the writer of adventure stories such as White Fang or The Call of the Wild. Jack London, apart from his writing, was also a turn of the century from the 19th to the 20th century journalist and he was an investigative journalism. And the work I bring to you today, The People of the Abyss, that was published in 1903, is investigative literary journalism. And what did Jack London do? Like many literary journalists that were contemporary, he went to the East End of London to have a first impression and to be an observer of what was an alien reality. The reality of crime, prostitution, extreme poverty that was harbored in the heart of the greatest, largest, richest empire the world had ever known, the British Empire, the empire in which the sun never set. Never set. So, he came from America, because he was an American, he was a North American, and he came to the East End to have this first account, first impression as an eyewitness and as a, 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 a participant observer in that reality. Many other uh, contemporary journalists, as I was saying, did the same experiment. Henry Mayhew, for example, and the Portuguese Jaime Batalha Reis is another example. And to commemorate, to mark the centenary of the publication of The People of the Abyss, this edition was published and it has a brilliant introduction by British Koenig. And I'd like to read to you what British Koenig says about the intention of Jack London to go to the East End and what he did. So he spent an amount of time there studying, interacting with the people, but in a way that he mingled with the other as another. He tried to immerse himself. And he tried to do that by dressing down. That is, he left all the trappings of his modern, civilized lifestyle. He dressed in rags and tatters, and he even sewed a coin to a, well, a piece of a garment so that if everything else failed and he needed to escape and he needed help, he would have a coin to get him out of the East End and into the safety of the West End. So writes British Koenig. He arrived in London at the beginning of August 1902 and for the next seven weeks lived among poor walkers and the unemployed in the East End. Significantly, London wrote both as an observer and as a participant. He not only conducted research into reports on the capital's poverty, but also dressed in rags, joined bread lines, sought refuge in those houses and attempted to sleep on the street disguised as a stranded American sailor. London named the resulting study the People of the Abyss, adopting a phrase coined by H.G. Wells. So he compares London to this bottomless abyss of human degradation. And when he gets to London, he is full of all these very good intentions and he has a plan and he wants to go to the East End and to study the people there and to see how they are living. But he finds out that things are not so simple as he thinks. And the first thing that it's really hard it's to get 
to the east end, as simple as that. To go to the east end will prove a difficulty, one of the first difficulties that he will encounter. And he says that he consults his friends and acquaintances, tries to get their help to go to the east end, but this is what they say. But we know nothing of the east end. It is over there, somewhere. And they wave their hands vaguely in the direction where the sun, on rare occasions, may be seen to rise. Then I shall go to Cook's, I announced. Oh yes, they said with relief. Cook's will be sure to know. But oh, Cook, oh, Thomas, Cook and Son, pathfinders and trail clearers, leaving signposts to all the world, and bestowers of first aid to bewildered travellers. Unhesitatingly and instantly, with ease and celerity, could you send me to darkest Africa or innermost Tibet. But to the east end of London, barely a stone's throw distant from Ludgate Sikas, you know not the way. You can't do it, you know, said the human emporium of roots and fares at Cook's Cheapside branch. It is so, I am so unusual. Consult the police, he concluded authoritatively when I had persisted. We are not accustomed to taking travelers to the East End. We receive no call to take them there and we know nothing whatsoever about the place at all. When he eventually gets to the East End, he will spend seven weeks with the people who live there. He will make and write this incredible account that is still read today as pungently as it was then. I remember reading it for the first time and praying to God that could help those people and then realizing these people are dead. Why am I praying for them? And realizing that the people that are dead so long ago about whom Jack London was writing do live somewhere in this world full of inequalities. So a very vivid account of the East End of the turn of the 19th to the 20th century. Jack London, the people of the abyss. If you want to have this historic document and this contemporary account of what was life then. This is a wonderful window to that past. And this is it for today. If you like these sorts of contents or if you have comments, leave them on the suggestions and also subscribe to the channel. As for me, it was a pleasure to be here, more so to, you know, talk to you a little bit about Jack London. Well, join me next time on House of Talisha because I will be waiting for you.